We got Dr. Braxton Hunter, pretty talented and well-known apologist, shared the stage with the William Lane Craigs to the Mike Laconas to all those guys. Jonathan Pritchett, Dr. Pritchett is here and he is a New Testament guy and does a lot of stuff, a lot of podcasts, a lot of debates, so on and so forth. So is the guy on the left Jerry Lewis and uh, Braxton's trying to be Dean Martin here? <laughs> the straight guy and the funny guy? They gave us nothing but tradition and no argument. All they did was get on this stage, yell real loud, and, and set a straw man on fire. Okay, now, this, it, I, I, I was not impressed. I need a dumb guy. Do I have any volunteers who wants to be my sidekick, the dumb guy? Uh, respectfully, that sounds like a little bit of a dodge. I'm claiming victory. It's where I come from, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Welcome to Trinity Radio. I am Braxton Hunter. And along with me is Jonathan Pritchett. And today we are talking about two new debaters that we really like. And other stuff. This is the first word. Science as religion never fails that we keep having the same false juxtaposition between faith and science, or religion versus science, as if the two are opposed. Uh, I think Christian apologists, for example, have made very compelling arguments that should have put that to bed a long time ago, not least of which David Wood's argument that, you know what, science is, that, that belongs to Christians, by the way. So, science is not opposed to faith or religion, but not only are the two compatible, but I'm here to argue that science itself, even uh, science not done under the auspices of uh, religious thinkers or religious scientists or practitioners of it, science itself is a religion. Does science or at least have adherence to this religion that claim that science is the ultimate source of knowledge and truth? Yes. That's very religious. Uh, do they have a priesthood? Yes, they have a priesthood. The lab coat priesthood is a real thing. Do they have gender disparity in the priesthood? Yes, there are far and away more men in science than women. If you don't believe me, listen to uh, the feminists talk about the lack of female representation in STEM fields like science. Do they have sacred texts? Absolutely. And I actually, unlike the scientific atheist types who don't like Christian religious texts, I actually like the scientific religious texts such as The Origin of the Species, The Voyage of the Beagle, and other books by Darwin, and I'm sure A Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking would make the cut. Do they have dogma? Absolutely they have scientific dogma. Do they ostracize people who reject the scientific dogma? Uh, yes. Uh, in fact, you can ask Michael Behe if you get rejected by an ostracized and excommunicated if you have differing opinions from the religious dogma. Do they have prophecies? Yes, they make predictions all the time. And just like false prophets in Christianity, not all of them come true. Do they have rituals? Absolutely. Science has plenty of rituals where they repeat the same things over and over to hopefully get the same results. Do they have relics? Yes, they have relics. Do they have iconography? Absolutely, they have their own iconography, have had so for uh, centuries now. Animal sacrifice? Yes, they slaughter more animals than religious people these days, all in the name of evolution and biological science. Plenty of animal sacrifice. Do they have charlatans? Oh, they've got plenty of charlatans too. Horrific, unimaginable evil and violence and injustice because of this religion of science. Plenty, ladies and gentlemen, I present the 20th century uh, as evidence. Is science a religion? Absolutely, has all the hallmarks. You can check down every single box. Science itself is a religion. And now, today's topic. All right, you're up. And welcome back. Welcome back, not only to the main topic, but welcome back to the studio. It's been a while, and I'm, I love this room. I love doing the shows in this room. I prefer doing the shows in this room because it means it's mostly me and 
Braxton and not other people who are great, but not me and Braxton. So there's something about this whole thing that I, and it's not a slight against all the other people, but we've been doing this show for years now, literally years. Mm -hmm. And it started before we became technologically advanced to about 2000. 7 2008 level technology that we're yeah. at now. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> we are. Uh, it started just you and me, and, a, and maybe we'd get somebody on a speakerphone or recording on the other end and then sending audio files that we'd mix or something. But mostly just you and me shooting the breeze about something. And there's, for me, probably no one else but me, there's always something that I'm going to love about just sitting in here with you in our uh, studio room just having the regular show. The Trinity Radio Batcave, as yeah. it were. Yeah, there, there is something special about the Pritchett-Hunter dynamic to some people. Yeah. Um, that sounds self-aggrandizing, but... Uh, yeah, and it's also... Inter- I'll just say this. It's also been... Please don't, like, rank your favorites here, but there is something nice about, like, whenever you had your debate back yeah. November of 2018 or 17 or whatever 17, it was, yeah. I... Uh, a lot of people came over because of you. Yeah. And I was starting to think, well, this is just the Jonathan Pritchett show it's and so I'm nice. the dumb sidekick. Right. And then yeah, after yeah. the Dillahunty debate, you started feeling that way, yeah. you know, but there's something about the, the, no, I cherish it though. I'm like <laughs> dumb sidekick right here, but you're not dumb. And people have said, uh, that they don't like that news. A few I people. saw that in the, in the thing, but come on. I mean, like, it's who who said that? the Pine, Pine Creek, Creek. Guy, smart alecky remarks about me being dumb psychic or whatever. Well, let's go ahead and jump into this. But I wonder this. if he ever got one. Let's let's because I, I'm great because I am a big reason why people tune in. Dumb psychics work. <laughs> I'm just saying. Come on, Pine Creek. Yeah, you know, deal with the program. Did you ever get one? No, you're still just d- listening to that weird easy listening elevator music before your show starts, and then you start saying typical internet atheist. Well, is he? See, now here's this is what I want to get into, and I don't. No, care is to... he? Is he the cut above? No, they told us that this him and that other guy who d- totally demolished the Kalam, blah blah blah. Yeah. These are the pinnacle of atheist thinkers. Now, g- give me Bertrand Russell, please. Yeah, somebody, somebody call so, Anthony Flew before he became wise in his, his elderly years and converted to. You're theism. on fire. Yeah, no, I'm just saying. Come on. Uh, no, I, no, these guys are great. I like these guys. I like Pine Creek Show, and I do like your elevator. I mean, I have a flock of seagulls on my uh, on my playlist. I'm not mm-hmm. judging anybody's musical taste. Yeah. But, so I like these guys, but I, I'm just saying I keep hearing the same stuff over and over. Now, to Pine Creek's credit, sometimes he'll get into uh, ancient cultures and ancient Greek literature and stuff like that that I find interesting because that's kind of stuff that I like. But most of the time... All of these guys who demolish the Kalam and tell they they're doing armchair psychology on why. Okay, we that what we stop believe. right there. Stop yeah. that, that. Okay, so here's what I want to say about this. Yeah. So there are. I'm going to do a video soon. I haven't actually put pen to paper on this, but I need to. I'm going to do a video on types of uh, atheist YouTubers, and I want to do it in such a way that it's not mockery, but that it that I think they could agree to a certain degree with what I'm saying. I'm not going to use. Uh, terminology or thing, and you can't. I get that people want to say you can't label persons, right? They're people. They're multifaceted. Okay, but you can label approaches, and there are approaches taken uh, by. We already do it for you in the apologetics world. Some of us are classicalists. Some of us are evidentialists. Some of us are cumulative case, presuppositional, reformed epistemology. We we provided those labels for you. I'm going to do a labeling. Uh, and do a video. It'll be a short video, uh, so people's attention spans won't. You know, I do long videos. Some people don't like it, but we're going to do a video, and I'm going to I'm going to categorize because there are very different types. Uh, you know, one of the earliest response videos I did was Godless Engineer in Pine Creek. I did that in one episode, and they're very very different. I said that then. Pine Creek is in a certain respect, and this isn't the label I'm going to use. I don't think for this type, but there are many types. Like there are many people that fall into this type that are psychologizers. Yeah. And what they do is they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna prognosticate and uh, do a psychoanalysis on uh, your Christian and figure out what sort of a Christian this is. Like what, what? How did they get to the place that they that they got to? How did they come to be? A Christian, uh, you know what was going on in their lives. What are they thinking? I mean, as we're speaking right now, as we're recording this podcast, yeah, what's Pine Creek's real name? 
Doug something. Doug. He's right now, as we're speaking, doing this on Twitter with one of my tweets. Yeah, you were, you were reading that before we started. Yeah. So I, I wonder if Doug uh, has a problem with authority, you know, might have been treated bad by his parents. I mean, you know, there's all... And I don't think so. Right, but I'm just saying if we're... But if we applied the stereotypes. Right, right? yeah. Why, and when I found, why bother? Who cares? And, and when I have found people that do not fit the stereotypical mold... For yeah. him, actually, they've just appeared on their own, yeah. you know. And and uh, in at least one case, I think, and he talked about this on his show, so it's fair game. The, in one case, that person was willing to go on a show and talk about how they came to become a Christian because of evidence, right? Because he says that rarely happens. Yeah. And uh, he suddenly came up with all these caveats why this guy doesn't count. He was too young. I think he was fourteen or something. Mm-hmm. He was too young. He uh, it happened too quick, you know. Okay, th- this is when things aren't going my way in terms yeah. of the way things are shaken out. We have to destroy it by the death of a thousand caveats, right? Yeah. And uh, so, but because it didn't fit the psychologizing that that needs to be done. So we have that type of person that is a psychologizer. Yeah. We have other people that are kind of more the rhetoricist, where it's just loud in your face, you know, sort of thing. Then we have people that are more analytical yeah. in, in a sense, like people like. Um, uh, cosmic skeptic or rationality rules. The, these are people that really are like, hey, give me your arguments. I'm going to tell you what I think is wrong with these arguments. There are various types, and here's the thing: it's very effective because what you know w- w- when you're when I'm judging a debate, and we're going to talk about some debates here in a moment. Mm-hmm. When I'm judging a debate between a Christian and an atheist, I don't just. There are a lot of people that just think whoever their guy was won just yeah. because, right? Um, but here's what you can do. Here's what you know. good debaters will do when watching another person debate, or their own debates, is consider when the, your opponent won points, and winning points doesn't just mean they were technically right or had good content. What else could, it, could happen well, that could win you points? Rhetorical, rhetorical points. Yeah, winning points with the audience. Yeah. And this is what I try to tell other Christians. When you're going to debate... You need to fo- you need to have good content for sure. You yeah. need to know your stuff, but you need to also know how to be the kind of person that wins points with the audience because you don't want to be right and lose because the audience doesn't like you or trust right. you or whatever it may be. Yeah, and of course another another thing that's really important that um, one of the debates we're going to talk about with Aaron Raw and um, the Michael Jones. Michael Jones. Um, one of the things is very important, and it's why I t- say that certain people win debates even when no one else does. Um, the debate question, satisfying, an- if you take the affirmative or the negative, and satisfying your burden of your position on the debate question, and making sure most of your your points are related to the debate question, is how you score debates. Like professionally, yeah. like if you're scoring these debates. And when I see people miff it on the uh, on the debate question, what is mm-hmm. it? And some people try to shift what the question of the evening actually is. Yeah. So, like... On both sides, that yeah. happens. Uh, yeah. and, and so, when I see people where, like in that particular debate, just use that as an example, I know we'll get more into it, but when Michael Jones, in the first minute and a half, corrected his opponent after his opening statement on the debate question, it's over. Right. Because the, the, the question was, is Christianity dangerous? And his point was that Christians were dangerous or Christians were bad. And it has nothing to do with Christians, human beings behaving in certain ways. Irrelevant to the debate question. Yeah. And once you've done that, you lost in the first minute and a half of your opponent's speak. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter what they say after that because you did not address the now, actual now, question. But here's the thing, and I think this is something that keeps internet atheism going in these debates. Is and some of them do. Some of them do tackle the topic of the debate. But is uh, you may still win points in the eyes of the audience yeah. if you shift it. But be aware of what's going on. Be a good debate watcher. So let's get into that. Well, so, not just that, but be a good debater and call your opponent out on it. Yeah, let me give you a simpler, yeah. before we jump into that one, let me give you a simpler example. So uh, a famous uh, internet atheist um, YouTuber uh, shared one of my tweets mm-hmm. recently. 
And so now I've got like all of a sudden, boom, like all these athe- I mean, it's just, I guarantee you right now I've got yeah. tons of responses that I haven't even gotten to just because we started this podcast. And, um, and I don't respond to most of them, but some of them I right. do. And this one person was, I, so I asked this question. I said, um, this is kind of a cumulative case approach, but I said, all right, look, uh, I want to know three questions because we always get this debate over what's really an atheist and what counts as an atheist. And I, here's what I want to know. I want to know what your worldview is. Uh, beyond that you don't believe in God. So here's here's three questions. You answer me these three questions, and I can approximate your worldview pretty well based on these three questions, at least generally. And the questions are, how did we get here? What's the meaning of life if there is one? And what happens when we die, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, then the follow-up, if you're not a Christian, is this question I want to know. What pieces of data that we agree about, like that we agree, both of us agree are real and true, uh, would you say that your worldview makes better sense of than my Christian worldview? Now, when we when I asked that question, I got some interesting responses. When it came to the to the fourth question, what what pieces of data? There was one person who said, "Well, the Shroud of Turin." Said, oh, wait a minute, hold on, wait. What for those of you that don't know, the Shroud of Turin is allegedly a. Uh, a shroud that bears the image of Jesus on it because it is supposed to be the burial cloth that Jesus right. was buried with. And people talk about that. And you whatever. know what I think yeah. about it? What? I I don't even No know. opinion. No opinion whatsoever. It has, it, it has not been a factor in my life. Now, when I've ever seen a documentary on it or heard Gary Habermas talk about it in, you know, in passing mm-hmm. or in a lecture, I'm like, huh. And then I don't think about it for the rest of my life. Right. So, so I mean, it's just like that's one of those things that I just I okay. It's, that's Whatever. A, that's an interesting thing about yeah. that, that that exists. Yeah. So, so my like, so remember is the it question. Jesus' face. Who cares? The, the, so the question I'm asking is this: it, the question I'm asking is a piece of data that we agree about that makes better sense on your worldview than mine. And they say the shot of Turin. And I said, wait a minute. You're saying that Christianity cannot account for the Shroud of Turin? And she's this part, I don't know if it's a male or female, but they say, uh, yeah, that's right. And, and I'm thinking, do you realize that most Christians I know are, don't even know what that is? Right. Secondly, many of them that do don't believe it. Right. And a few of them do. How does Christianity live or die based on the shout? Here's how Christianity accounts for the shout of Turin. If it's true, Christianity definitely accounts for it. If it's made up, Christianity accounts for it. It yeah. plays no role. In- Christi- Christians invented this. Thing, <laughs> yeah, you know, it plays no role in Christi- Christianity. But the point is, this guy, and I even asked, why are in the world are we talking about the shout of Turin when I'm asking you, what piece of data does your worldview account for that Christianity does not account for? Right, like... Right? like um why is there something rather than nothing? Or? Yeah, so on our side, yeah. we've got stuff that we think our worldview accounts for much will, better than, yeah. than an athe- some atheistic worldview. I realize atheism is not a worldview, but some atheistic worldview, some worldview that contains atheism. Atheism right? is a worldview. It is a view of the world. Of course, where it impacts are, your other beliefs. Right. It, right? This is, why? Read The Web of Beliefs by W.V.O. Quine. Yeah, well, no, I mean, I'm tired of the whole what is an atheist. I'm like you, well, who cares? Just tell me what you think. But seriously, it's time to grow up with the lack of theism. Always trying to be so pedantic, and then throwing a major fit when we demand to be pedantic too, and about certain things like are, faith, like faith. When it's actually there's a ton of scholarship, and unless you're reading Kierkegaard, who sorry was not a first century Greek speaking New Testament author, right? You know, either it's either Kierkegaard on the Christian side, or you can go to like Twain, who's not a Christian by any stretch of the imagination, an atheist, who's, who's basically the same definition. Well, probably what's happening more than that is hearing from people they grew up with on the pew behind them. Yeah. And taking their word for what faith must be. But let's get into that now. So the debate. So you pointed out a really interesting piece that I had forgotten to bring up, but that's a good thing to bring up. So we had this debate. This is the Bible and Beer Consortium uh, with Aaron Raw. And uh, Michael Jones, who Oops. runs the channel Inspiring Philosophy. Yes. Very, and, um, very, very good channel. Yeah, very impressed with Michael Jones. Yeah. So, uh, now, do I agree with him on everything? No. No, no I don't agree with him. You don't you, agree with me on everything? Who, that's right. Why do you caveat everything like that? Well, because there are people out there. It's like, I love, rest in peace, Norman Geiser lost a great apologist this, this past week. Is And everywhere, it's, I, I love the guy, didn't agree with him. Uh, it's every everyone has to say. You know what, Miguel Benitez, you Calvinist, you love you, man. 
Yeah, but you did kind of caveat it. You just pointed out something you disagree about. <laughs> I didn't say, I don't agree with everything you say, <laughs> but I love you. No. Yeah, but see, there are people out there who don't think like you and I do, and they'll be like, he just affirmed the totality of everything Michael Jones ever said. I have people, every time I use a quote, for, whenever I do live public discussions, and I uh, like not debates, but lectures at yeah. churches, I, you, you ha- saw it happen to me. I use uh, a, a line uh, Hugh from Ross. Hugh Ross, yeah. and I will without question have people come to me and say, I agree with Hugh Ross on the thing you quoted him on, but do you know he's wrong about X, Y, and Z, and so you shouldn't be supporting his ministry as if you agree with him on everything. What the heck, you know? So, but I do have to caveat. But anyway, yeah, and I think that's that. I think it is it, dumb. It's, Michael Jones it's, is great. Okay, get yeah. over it. So here, so anyway, they had this debate, and the debate topic was: Is Christianity dangerous? Yeah. All right. See, when we get to Trent Doherty, we're going to say, "Well, he's great, but you know, he number one, he's a Catholic, and two, he says naughty words on occasion, like, uh, like Stanley Howard has been doing that for decades, and he's fine." So I mean, you know. But this kind of thing just drives me. I, I like people. Doesn't mean I. It should go without saying. I don't. If I can do a show with you, mm-hmm. uh, you know. What are you saying? That there's something intrinsic about me you shouldn't like. <laughs> well, no. If I can do, I mean, well, no. There's a lot of differences between us. Uh, yeah. On, on, oh, just because we disagree, we can still function. Right. I mean. Yeah. Golly. Go back for those of you that are new. Go back and check out where we've had our own little debates yeah. that we've made public. Where I always win. It's it's this. I don't I don't I don't get it. It's probably anyway. Knowing <laughs> atheists has helped both of us. Sure. Not not internet people, but being able to sit down and have a cup of coffee where it's not quite so. Yeah, iced crossing. coffee. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, you actually get to know people, and yeah. and you get to know why they think the way they think without it always having to be one upsmanship. Right. You know, back and forth. It's, it's, come on. So so this debate happened. Go and, get a friend that doesn't. And and anyway, and, and uh, you should want to be Brax's friend. I'm Brax's friend. He buys me lunch every now and then. It's pretty cool. So Aaron Raw and Michael Jones. So Aaron Raw kept making the debate about whether Christianity is true. Yeah, and, and kept Michael jo- about it. Are Christians have Christians behave badly? Right. I'm the first person to say. Now, number one, I wouldn't have given him the the, the free ride that Michael Jones would. I said that. Well, the first two to three Crusades were good ideas. I'm sorry that war is not always. Uh, a good. Uh, uh, it's unfortunate that any war happens, but I'm sorry. But if hordes and hordes of people are trying to rape and pillage and stuff, even for whatever reason, sometimes you got to go knock that stuff off. So I think that the, at least the first few crusades could be justified. So it's not just this blanket. Now, Michael Jones didn't was rightly pointed out that number one, no connection between. Uh, for most of those wars, there's been a scholarship on this. He cited the scholarship in the thing about almost no world religion uh, conflicts had to do with religion yeah. as the fundamental reason why, and that's been you know five to ten percent at the most. And he cited the source. I, I read that you know that study's about twenty years old now. Yeah, he also um, cited. He also knocked down the uh, the thing about. Atheists are have a higher IQ on average, or whatever it is, yeah. than believers do. Yeah, he knocked that down too, which was interesting. But all of that, but but he did the right thing by saying, "Look, a lot of these things that people think are religions done so much warring and all that. Well, actually, no, that you need to settle down. It's not that simple. That, that's a talking point." But if that talking point's fair, guess what? 20th century atheism, yes, it was atheism. I don't care that you say, well, it wasn't in the name of atheism. I'm sorry, atheists in, in the 20th century, you own that millions and millions of people. Well, but here's but, the but thing. You don't want if that gets that. you all ticked off, yeah. then knock it off, right? right? We're not bringing that but stuff. No, You're I, bringing I, that I, stuff. I, yeah, but I'm actually like, yeah, Christians have done some horrible things. I, Inquisition, yeah, Salem Witch Trials. You sure throw that in there? The 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 blood bloody reformation on Catholics and reformers? Yeah, put that in the bucket of bad Christians. I'm so what? Who cares? Yeah. You know? Christians and, are sometimes terrible. Yeah. Does that mean that Christianity is false? No, obviously not. There's a logical leap there. And secondly, does it mean that Christianity is dangerous? Yeah. But Muslims have done horrible things. Atheists, whether they did it in the name of atheism or not, is irrelevant because Christians, whether they do it in the name of Jesus or not, that's religion. So I'm going to point the same finger and say atheists and atheistic regimes have done enormous 
bloodshedding in, in, in just in one century alone did plenty. And so I'm sorry, it, whether it, you know whether you want to say it was they were well, the atheism was it if they were real humanists. I saw Matt Dillahunty say this. Well, they didn't do it in the name of humanism because no humanist would ever blah blah blah. Well, who cares? They're still atheists or mm -hmm. atheistic regimes, and whether they did it for th their atheism or not is irrelevant. Just like whether they did it because they were Christians or not is irrelevant. But at least in some cases, I can own some of it. I've yet to see an atheist be like, yeah, some atheists have done some really horrible things. Right. So come on. If Christians can own up to uh, you know a good chunk of the horrible things you want to throw at it, well, own up to some of this atheist horrible stuff. But like you said, has no bearing on the question of truth. Right, fact, and it, and and it is for Christianity because it, Christianity posits that everybody's <laughs> radically sinful and in need of a savior. That's and right. there's a good example of why even right. the Christians, right? You know, because when you're saying atheists can be horrible people, Christians can be horrible people, Muslims can be horrible people. What are we learning? We're learning that people can be horrible people, right? Yeah, and this is this goes back to a tweet you made about you know. Uh, if you can find something, it's possible that Christians have thought about whatever your right. particular issue is. And this this is a point of the Christian theology, justification by faith, you're saved by grace through faith, mm -hmm. right? This is a, a stickling point that, yes, the thief of the cross who's probably reprehensible, we don't know, but probably horrible, guilty, he said that him and his, the other guy deserved to be there, right? Yeah, Jesus by his did. own admission. Right, yeah. yeah. So uh, we don't know the extent of that, but we do know that at least he felt that way. And then, yes, his death cross, so to speak, or death, you know, after all of that, Jesus is going to take him because of his confession right there on the cross. It didn't take much. It wasn't, yes, I believe in the death and burial and the resurrection, and I believe all of this other, you know. Mm -hmm. it, it was just, you didn't, you're the innocent man. You didn't deserve this. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. So some theology, maybe, um, recognition of who, who Jesus was, right? And he goes to heaven. And... Um, there's going to be some people who live better moral lives than that thief on the cross who don't. But that's a issue for other people. It's like, how is that just? Well, like you said, you have to come inside Christianity. And it, to me, it is a sign of how, I'm sorry, willful ignorance these atheists are striving to achieve when it comes to Christian theology from the inside. As if, Okay. Yeah, now we're not saying you're will we're not talking about the willful ignorance of disbelief in general. No. That's a different subject you're, that we talked about you're before. You're striving an effort to not understand Christianity if it that's what you're like. going to talk about. You're you you champion your own ignorance and it's sad because mentioning Bertrand Russell again, you know what he said the greatest idea that St. Paul ever came up with? What? Original sin. And then he repurposed that in, within his own worldview, but he thought it was a interesting idea in the history of Christian thought because he was aware of Christian thought. And he said, you know, and Freud and all these other people were aware of Christian thought, and that's why their critiques have more purchase than modern atheists who seem totally ignorant. I get it that you don't want to read uh, uh, James Leo Garrett's two-volume Systematic Theology. But if you try to pass yourself off as having any sort of intellectual capacities whatsoever, you will have read Augustine, Aquinas, and Calvin. At least that. At mm -hmm. least some of that. Because mm -hmm. they're in the, I mean, even the great books of the Western world recognizes that. Harvard Classics recognize those guys. I mean, at mm -hmm. least even Calvin's preface of the Institutes made it into the famous prefaces volume of the Harvard Classics. But you get the Institutes, uh, Aquinas, all, all this. Yeah. You will have read some Christian thought. Right. But you demonstrate a capacity to have, well, uh, believe in Jesus, you go to heaven, everyone else goes to hell. And that is the extent of your Christian knowledge. And, and I don't care what Bible verses you got from the website of wehatethebible.com and decide to bring those up in your debates showing that you've given it no exegetical thought or serious consideration whatsoever is also a sign of intellectual laziness. Because one thing apologists do well is they study their opponents and they study their arguments and they study the not just the thought, but they... They, they know the great books of the Western world and the history of great ideas and the great conversation and all that to see how we got to where we are today, which is why this is so important. And atheists, even the popular atheists, used to do that. I miss old school atheists yeah. who said there is no God. Well, here's something. And they were familiar enough with 
Christian theology to reject it, at least from an internal critique, whether they were mm. right or wrong, they, they, it's not so. Every every internet atheist I, I've encountered have, have more or less jettisoned trying to understand, except for Pine Creek. Pine Creek at least has a familiarity with Christian theology internally, not just the surface stuff, not just the stuff that everyone argues about, but he seems to know because he seems to understand the differences in various Reformed traditions versus Catholic traditions and all that other stuff, and that I appreciate. But most of these people that are tweeting at you and arguing in YouTube comments, not a chance. Well, And here's, here's something that I want to say to the Christians as well out there, as the atheists. If what you have, and I don't want to denigrate the, the person who lives a peaceable and simple Christian life. I don't, I don't want to denigrate that. Not everyone is meant to get a PhD in these things. But I want to say if you're a Christian or a skeptic out there, if what you have is you grew up in church and then you watched a bunch of YouTube videos and maybe at some point or another you read a couple of books, that does not a theologian or Bible scholar make. You have to put a little more work into it than that. I know N.T. Wright says we're all theologians. But, but well, every the, Baptist... <laughs> Malcolm Yarnell says, uh, but 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 the thing is, Al Mohler it, says that the, if you don't, if you're not aware, as I've seen a lot of times here, if you're not aware among Christians and among atheists, yeah. if you're not aware of why it is that God being omniscient does not re- necessarily remove libertarian free will of the creatures, then please read some books. Yeah. Please, please don't just watch but you YouTube. You don't even videos. have to be a scholar. Well, and again, it's the sign of the times and the poor education in this country. I mean, we, when we talk about reading the classics, classical education, which will involve some Christian literature, and it will involve some other things. Just This is why we need to harp on the great books every episode. Just great books, great books, great books. Because the common person, these were, these, the great books, one of the features about them is that they were general writings for general audiences. They weren't even academic types. They were just written... For for ev- for for the every man and every woman, mm-hmm. and you know what the every man and the every woman up until um, a few decades ago was familiar with all of that literature. The so so state. so you're right. So now let's let's so transition. And let's atheists can do better. Let's tra- yes. Let's transition back to the debate. Uh, so another thing that happened that I thought was really important to discuss is this i this insistence. This absolute insistence that faith means believing without evidence. Yeah. Now, uh, Pine Creek, uh, not Pine Creek. Uh, Michael Jones did a good job of laying out what the biblical understanding of faith was and how that word was used. Pistis was used outside of the New Testament yeah, anyway. with extant literature, yeah. and how it just doesn't mean what skeptics today demand that it means. Now, I'm not going to just rely on Michael Jones or my own response here. We talked about this in the Matt Dillahunty debate. But genetically modified skeptic Mm -hmm. seemed to indicate recently that we should move past that. The definition of faith is, I feel like this is what I might get the most pushback on in this video. Let me paint a picture of a common interaction I've seen between primarily Christians and atheists, which I think is problematic. An atheist asserts that having faith is not a reliable way to determine truth. A Christian says it can be in some instances. The atheist says that believing something without evidence or having faith is irrational, to which the Christian responds that they don't have that kind of faith and that they define faith as trust based on prior experience or action. The atheist explains that the Christian doesn't actually have faith then, but trust. The Christian says, no, I do have faith, to which the atheist replies, oh, so you admit that you believe things without evidence? I know that scenario seems to paint the atheist rather uncharitably, but I have seen that exact conversation play out a few times. Here's what's going wrong there. The atheist in that scenario is holding to a rigid definition of faith, assuming and asserting that it can have only one meaning. The reality is, faith means very different things to different people. Plenty of religious people do essentially define faith as belief without evidence or belief that is justified by its mere existence without outside justification. I understand why atheists, especially in the U.S., often define faith that way too, but other religious people have different definitions. So if we're talking to a religious person and they bring up faith, we have to understand what they mean by that before engaging them on it. 
But but then I'll, so so we've heard that now. But but I also want I want you I want to I want to just tell you this. So I've got right here. So one of the passages that, that everybody loves to cite is Hebrews eleven one. Mm-hmm. You know, let me tell you what a good translation of Hebrews eleven one actually would be. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. I don't have a problem with the word evidence. You just can't freight it down with all this modern, right? You know, and and by the way, this comes in a chapter replete with examples of people who exercised faith on the basis of great evidence, like really obvious supernatural stuff going on that we yeah. don't see the way they saw it. Now, what I have people say in response to that, yeah, but no, I don't think any of that's real. That's to miss the point. Right. That's to miss the point. We're trying to figure out how this word was used. Right. Whether you think those stories of God appearing and doing all these things for these Old Testament characters, whether you think that was that really happened or not, the author did and, and used faith in, with respect to that, yeah, and so they they understood faith to be trusting yeah. based on really good evidence, yeah. perhaps. And, and well, uh, I mean, I think you, you can have trust, commitment, loyalty, uh, all of that kind of thing. Those are all shades, sure, yeah, nuances of, of yeah. the and and the extant Greco-Roman literature from you know 500, 600 BC forward attest to this. You yeah. know, you can you can look at classical Greek. You can look at Koine Greek. Either way, whoever you look at is a trust loyalty. I trust that my wife and loves it, me. Yeah, and it's and it's based and I, and one of the definitions I like best is trust or loyalty based on past performance. Yeah, I because trust. There's always an element of the past performance. I I trust that my wife loves me. Yeah, I can't prove it with Cartesian certainty, but is it based on nothing? No, it's based on a lot of really good evidence. Yeah, and who cares about Cartesian certainty anyway? Yeah, it's I know some worthless. people get 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 ate up about it, but yeah, I mean, who cares? But it, So in the New Testament, the word pistis is used 227 times. Mm-hmm. I can actually give you in each book, in Matthew 8 times, Mark 5 times, Luke 11 times, Acts 14 times, Romans 35 times, yeah, but, and so on and so forth. I get go through every book. What about one verse where you walk by faith and not by sight? Well, respond to it. Huh? Respond well, to well, it. Well, what do you think? Well, I think, so take Thomas, for example. Okay. Everyone wants to criticize Thomas. because uh, Everyone speaks as though Jesus was maligning Thomas. For for one of those evidence. who don't see and believe, right? Know. But the point the point there was not that you should believe based on nothing. Right. The point was Thomas had already seen, right. and heard incredible testimony, and had yes. incredible reason to believe. And walk by faith, not by sight. You should have the confidence that the Lord will deliver you and provide for you and care for you, uh, even if it doesn't seem like it visibly right, around you right now, point, based yeah. on what's happened in the past. Right. Based on the past. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So, so that's what the walk by the it's not it's not it's not saying decontextualize do this yeah blindfold yourself so here's so that's here's a not good point so here's a good thing Theophilus of Antioch in his letter to Autolycus book one chapter eight talks about faith this way. He says, Do you not know that faith is the leading principle in all matters? For what husbandman can reap unless he first trusts his seed to the earth? Or who can cross the sea unless he first entrusts himself to the boat and the pilot? And what sick person can be healed uh, unless he first trusts himself to the care of the physician? And what art of knowledge or knowledge can anyone learn unless he has first applies and entrusts himself to the teacher? If then the husbandman trusts the earth and the sailor of the boat and the sick the physician, will you not place confidence in God even when you hold so many pledges at his hand? In other words, you trust in all these different situations because you have good evidence that the pilot can get you there. You have good evidence that the physician can heal you. You have good evidence that the crops are going to grow. So why wouldn't you trust God when you have good evidence that he is faithful? This is just false. The idea that faith means what it means to some lay Christians and lay atheists in the pews or on the street that it, this colloquial idea that it means believe in what you know ain't so or believing in the face of evidence, right. this is just false. Get past it. And if you won't get past it, when it's been demonstrated to you that you're just wrong about what... I realize there are going to be some Christians that play into what your, what your definition is. But when you realize that scholarly and academic Christians... I mean, it was fantastic when Eric Hernandez, Trinity man, at least for the moment... Um, stood up and asked Arn Ra in the debate, in the question and answer time, how is it that when Michael Jones just asked you for any singular academic scholarly voice that defines faith the way you do, 
you aren't able to give one. Is that not dangerous? Is that not dangerous to thinking? Is that not problematic? So you mentioned that in 20 years of rigorous research, you found no evidence of what you're looking for. But then when Michael pressed you on naming just one scholar who defines the word faith in the way you put it, you couldn't name one. So my question is, could it be possible that your research is maybe flawed, biased, and even maybe dangerous to the pursuit of truth? I have conducted this experiment, as I explained, over and over and over and over again, having this exact conversation at least once a week for 20 years. Not one Christian ever has produced evidence. He didn't either, nor can you. No one can. It doesn't exist. That's not the I debate I demand tonight. that anybody, anybody in this room who calls yourself a Christian, if you think you have scientific evidence to indicate you're God, bring it. You ain't got it. I win. I'm sorry my question upset you, but that wasn't my question, but I'll move on. Thank you. And Arnon Ra basically went off yeah, went about around. how there's no evidence. That is a separate question, and what he and, and this is an important point that didn't get brought up. He he said, oh, "I don't care what they say. There's no evidence, so they're believing without evidence. So that's what faith is. The fact that you disagree with them about whether they have evidence or not is a separate question then what the from what they mean by faith. Right? Uh, come on, or, or Guess what? There's no such thing. If you lack a belief in God, you're not an atheist. So quit calling yourself an atheist. You don't have you have the lack theist experience, Matt Dillahunty. If we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this. You wanna quibble about that, Aaron Raw, and I know he's buddies. Fine. If you just lack a belief, you're not an atheist. Or like let's do to your it, position we, what you're doing the with same, the faith it's position. The same thing. Let's say, okay, I understand what you what you how you define atheist. But from my perspective, an atheist is someone who believes against the evidence about God. <laughs> yeah. Therefore, atheism means one who believes against the evidence. Yes. Would that be fair? No, of course not. So don't try to redefine faith based on what you think about Christian answers to things. Right. And the, of course, it all stems from, by evidence, our and raw means scientific evidence, which I think he called himself an epistemist, which is not a thing. Because uh, at first I thought he said... Yeah, and he was talking, on the other debate, he was talking to an actual epistemologist. Right. And the guy said, I don't know, what, what yeah, are you, you talking you about? you don't know, you don't have a clue. <laughs> but, uh, but he, you know, at first I thought he said empiricist. So I went back and clicked it back because I was listening really fast. And no, he just coined I'm an epistemologist. But his, his epistemology is, if you can't know it by science... You don't know it. And he says, I'll take anything as evidence. Like, see, you and I would, I think, say, okay, if... So Islam... Is an observable set of facts that we can all... So Islam yeah. and Christianity both affirm a theism. Yeah. Uh, they affirm theism. So uh, if we have a piece of evidence that would count in favor of Christianity and Islam, but against, say, Hinduism, yeah, that's still evidence for theism. Yeah. Right, that's evidence for both Christianity and Islam, and then we've got to go further from there. Right, um, he counts something as evidence if it indicates one thing over another that cannot be used in support of the other thing. Well, kind of, but he only considers evidence in within the realm of science because he said well, by evidence true. I mean. Yeah. So that right there is a self-defeating proposition uh, for his epistemology, which shouldn't. It, this is why it, the fact that don't talk about reason and logic when you when you can't have a self-defeating uh, contradiction right in the face and you can't grasp it. So mm -hmm. you're done talking about reason and logic until you figure that out and stop being stop buying into the scientism. But to your point about his wider use, he is to his credit, he is right. This is the problem with. Uh, I see with this chaotic self-education that these atheists try to engage in because it becomes chaotic knowledge. They're grasping from here, grasping here, but they have no coherence. Um, he is right that data and facts are neutral. They don't become evidence for anything except pressed in service to an argument to point to one thing over another. That, that is true. That I agree with him. Facts is a fact. That's why I don't believe... All the evidence for evolution. No, you have data. You have fact. Well, there are various. Uh, now you can press that in the service. There are various uh, definitions of evidence and. Well, ways yeah, I know, but I'm yeah. just saying I do agree that facts. You agree with his position? In, well, it, yeah. I agree with his position that facts in and of themselves don't prove anything. 
You have mm-hmm. to press those in service by way of an argument to sure. make it evidence for a position. Absolutely right about that. You know what he's absolutely wrong about? What counts as evidence? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, that's and, the... that's I think the Trent made that... Yeah, so now we're moving yeah. into the Trent Doherty uh, yeah. debate with the same person, Aaron Raw. And I don't know how much I can... Uh, the, Their the debate thing, had nothing to do with the question. <laughs> he wanted to debate again. They actually said you wanted two debates within a re- relatively recent time. Yeah. Uh, but no, I, but that debate ha- actually had nothing to do with is Christianity dangerous for the most part. And, and it wasn't Trent Doherty's fault. He was trying to unravel what was being given to him. And what and, and I think it seemed like he was supposed to get an opening statement like Arn Ra did and, mm-hmm. and didn't because Arn Ra kept challenging him or whatever. Yeah. But um, in Well, the, it, let's be fair again. Uh, Trent did his share of talking over Arn Ra. Yeah, too. okay. Okay, fair enough. But Trent Doherty, I, what, this faith thing came up again. Yeah. And I loved it with Trent Doherty. He's like, I don't know anyone who agrees with you about that. I was, all I was saying was that it makes sense to me that you're coming from a Mormon background. Because this I, I, I'm not coming faith, from a Mormon background. As, well, you, we can roll back the tape that you were raised by Mormon parents, whatever. Right, that, right. I was. I was. That you but, had sort of imbued in you this idea of faith that comes out of Mormonism. No. Which is the burning of the bosom. No. Because your concept of faith is utterly, totally foreign to the, to the Roman Catholic uh, concept. Yeah, it's foreign because to Mormons, it's from, too. It's foreign to Mormons, too, but it's actually what the, the scripture says. The and it's not ages, just... Aquinas, it's not just the Christian scripture. It's, the 19th it's, Muslim, it's Muslim scripture and period. Hindu scriptures. No Christian that I know of personally. I know. I know. Every Christian I've ever Hindu. talked to, we always have this argument. Well, that oh, might, there might be a reason I for tell that, him, I tell I mean, them that's that. kind of like, maybe you ought to ask them what they believe. Hey, I do. I do. I prove my point. Because prove- maybe they know what they believe, and maybe the reason they believe it is because it's what's espoused in Scripture. It's what's espoused by the major thinkers of the Christian faith from the medieval period through the Enlightenment. He's like, in this book, they disagree with you, heavy academic book, and he goes through just a list of them, yeah. and he's like, no, this doesn't... And on evidence, too. But here's the thing on, on the, what counts as evidence. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, we've got this whole thing. What I liked about both Trent and... Uh, Michael Jones, Trent Doherty and Michael Jones, both of their debates with Aaron Raw. Aaron Raw, give me the give me the data, give me the evidence, give me the science, give me the this. Now, who brought out more scholarship in both debates? The Christian. The Christians. So just using words like scholarship because you know the word, and using words like peer review because you've heard it before. Barbers get peer review; it's overrated. Don't the accountants do peer review? Law for, peer review is not what you think it is, probably. Peer review in science is meaning other people tried something too and it worked. It doesn't get you to the therefore. It gives you, yeah, this happened, just like you said it would happen. Mm-hmm. It doesn't get mm-hmm. you to any therefore. It mm-hmm. just, this happened. Peer review, you've had a peer reviewed articles, Christians peer review. So don't, and science is not more sacred than it is for barbers who get peer reviewed. <laughs> okay, peer review is peer review. Yeah. Okay, but just because you know the word and you know the word scholarship. Is that like ordination? Yeah, that's their version of ordination. Right. If you got peer reviewed, yeah. <laughs> if if just because you know the words doesn't mean you've actually read a whole lot of it, that other people who this is what you talk about, you want scholarship, you want peer review, and they bring in truckloads of it compared to your one or two things that you cited that you couldn't find the reference in the middle of your debate. You know, well, I can get you the footnote. Well, maybe they both did that. But. Did no? Did you notice that in the? video from Bible Beer Consortium yeah. in the uh, uh, description of yeah. the video, they linked uh, a file that you can download that is all of Michael Jones' uh, bibliography. Right. And it's like two pages. Yeah, and, 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 and yeah, that's, that's, that's the turf you wanted. You got it, and guess what? You got hammered for it. And, and by the way, did you notice what happened? At least in the, in the beer and... What is it? The, the Bible and Beer Consortium. Bible and Beer Consortium. In that, he's like, he takes kind of almost like my attitude about peer Well, just because it's peer-reviewed and in the sky, it may have the wrong conclusion. It may be wrong. So you, that's what you wanted. And then when you don't like what you're hearing from the overwhelming consensus of scholarship, you're like, yeah, but. Well, I agree. That's fine. Yeah, yeah and I could, be, I could be wrong about this. You, you've lost the position. My point is you've lost the position to complain when somebody, yeah, buts your source. 
right? When you start right. yeah, but and everything, yeah. so you yeah. can't complain when and, you're and like, yeah, some... but it's peer review. But even though it's peer review, doesn't mean that their conclusion is right. I have to read it for myself and look at it. Blah, blah. Uh, agree, do that. But then, but yeah. you can't complain anymore when somebody knocks your uh, article that no one ever read. Yeah, you know? and, and, I, and there was so, somewhere in there where, and I may get this a little bit and wrong. And that works in any But field. Michael Jones said something, he quoted him from some other debate. Maybe it's Tyler Vela debate that yeah. that uh, that Aaron Raw had. He quoted him saying something like, "If the science says X, then I'm forced to believe the science and change my opinion about something." So Michael Jones laid out all this science, and he's like, "So you said you would believe, basically. I've got I've made it for you, a little care package for you of of all this evidence, right? You know, so." Uh, yeah. Anyway, I, I I enjoyed both of those debates, and I like both Michael Jones and Trent Doherty. We didn't yeah. talk very much about I either like one. I like Raw for the most part until because he always starts off. He seems like a very likable, reasonable, well spoken guy. But in in both those debates, in his debate with uh, or or in his hallway discussion with John Mark Reynolds, I've always seen him. It, he sometimes for whatever reason he becomes a, a little bit unhinged and. And, and whatever, and uh, but for the most part, you know, he's all right. Oh, people could say that about you, right? <laughs> yeah, but but I mean, for but but he, it seems like he grasps that different. It's like it's that's what I'm saying. All of it, he knows a lot of stuff. It's just all chaotic and it's not organized in his head very well because he's grabbing for this and he's grabbing for this. He's grabbing for this, and it, 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 there's no coherence to it. At least Matt Dillahunty has more coherence in the, the way that he argues. Same with like uh, Pine Creek and genetically modified skeptic. You always find a coherence in their argumentation. It's like when this thing falls, I have to prop up something else and I'll sling this to the wall, even though it has nothing to do with what I was just. Yeah, and to Dillahunty's credit, he'll call out his own people when they do something wrong. Right. For example, there was another Bible and Beard debate. I think it was with uh, Blake Genta, that Dillahunty and Blake Genta. And uh, there, Aaron Ross showed up in the Q&A time and asked something, and there was a little bit of a discussion, and Dillahunty basically was like, yeah, that to me is not a good, you know, he, he shut it down. You know, yeah. and, and so I, I appreciate uh, that level of things. But I, I just want to say, both of these guys, if you're not subscribed to them, uh, uh, Trent Doherty and Michael Jones. Oh, I love his podcast name, Slam Harris. Slam Harris. I, 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 I can't wait for the first episode. Yeah. Did you watch the introductory video? That yeah. was the first atheist propaganda book I ever read. Was The End of Faith by Sam Harris. Right. So I'm looking forward to that. And um, what a what a what a what a clever name. He's gonna yeah. be good at this. I know he's. Talking I think about you can get that at slamharrispodcast.com. Yeah. What you, but 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 he he had this great. When I saw him debate this other guy, he said the guy was saying we could be in the matrix and we can't really know or whatever. And I loved him because he's got this accent and everything, but he's really smart. And he says, I want to know why you think you can't know you're in the matrix. Cause I think that's crazy. <laughs> and I just thought it was just fantastic. I knew yeah. I was going to love this guy. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, uh, we kind of talked about these two debates. Go watch we them for yourself. A lot of I said, and a lot of stuff. One of them I is said on. So the, you, you, we didn't mislead what, these what, debates and other stuff. One of the debates is on the Bible and beer consortium. Uh, you can go search that at YouTube. Another one is on modern day debates. All right, check out our other programs, uh, our sister programs. The uh, you forget the, the narrow path with Steve Grant, yes. Soteriology One Hundred and One with Doctor Layton Flowers, and the Bible Bro Down with Matt Chisholm and. Billy Winland. Also, while we're at it, since we've been discussing their stuff, go check out um, uh, Inspiring Christianity. Go check Inspiring out... Inspiring Philosophy. Also, go check out Capturing Christianity with Cameron yeah. Bertuzzi. What did I say? You said Inspiring Christianity. You just put the two together. Okay. Inspiring Philosophy and Capturing Christianity. And then go check out uh, Mike Winger's show, because he's been he's he's promoted us, and I appreciate him. But more than yeah. that, he's got a fantastic channel. Just had Mike Lycona on. Yeah. And so go check out Mike Winger. We got Winger. patrons, too, so we need to read their names next time. We're going to read the names. If you'd like to become a patron, click up here somewhere yeah, yeah. around the picture of L. Ron Hubbard, yeah. or just go to patreon.com slash Trinity Radio, and we'll see you next time on Trinity Radio. This is the last word. On internal experience and evidence. There's a type of evidence that Christian apologists don't talk about, at least not on the popular level very much. You kind of have to dig to get to it, and that is internal evidence of the truth of the Christian uh, message. And the reason that it doesn't get spoken about very much is because what gets 
popular attention is that which we can use for other people to impact them, to show them that Christianity is true. But as William Lane Craig has famously said, apologetics is how you show that Christianity is true, but your own experience of the Holy Spirit is how you know that Christianity is true. I'd like to speak to that as it relates to people who used to be in the church and now are not in the church. Obviously, we have incredible evidence, uh, the, the cos- various cosmological arguments, design arguments, moral arguments, historical arguments for the resurrection of Jesus, abductive arguments. We've got all kinds of arguments. As I've said before, every physical object and concept in the universe can be used as part of a compelling case for the existence of God, and I believe we can go further to the Christian God. However, for those of you that have heard all of that, and for whatever reason you're still out there as an agnostic or perhaps an atheist, I'd like to present you with internal evidence that perhaps you've experienced at one time or another. You remember the time that you were sitting in a church service and felt like God was dealing with your heart? You remember being at that church camp and you were absolutely, utterly convinced of the truth of Christianity? I recall one time when a horrible, horrible, horrible situation had taken place in my life. And I remember at a gas station putting the pump back on the rack and going over and sitting on a cement wall, putting my feet in the grass and praying and crying. And instantly, I experienced a phenomenon, didn't see anything, didn't hear an audible voice, didn't feel a physical touch, but there was an immediate and undeniable awareness that God was there with me, as if wrapping his arms of love around me. I remember telling myself in that moment, Braxton, if there are ever times of doubt in the future, go back to this moment, this undeniable moment, when you know that it's true. I I know what you're thinking. I've heard the atheist comments. Well, we have emotional experiences and all kinds of things. You can listen to Leonard Skinner and get the same experience. You can listen to Coldplay and get the same experience. You can be a Hindu and have had the same experience. But there's something different about this, and I mean that. You can say, well, it's special pleading, and that's fine. Don't buy it if you don't want to. But for the person out there who has had such experiences and then later walked away, I ask you to consider whether this internal evidence might actually be evidence. Does it count for something with you? Or have you brushed it aside because someone else convinced you that the only things that count as evidence are those things in the bottom of a beaker? I'd encourage you to come home, to trust what you know is real, and come to the God that you at one point experienced. He's waiting today.